Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Beloved, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, 
it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord? For all the good things he has done for me. I will lift up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. 
So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Tonight is a night of commandment. Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy comes from the Latin mandatum, meaning commandment. But what kind of commandment is this? Not a stern order, but a loving teaching that we should serve and love one another as Jesus served and loved his disciples. But what a strange Maundy Thursday we're observing this year on perhaps what is one of the most embodied, most fleshly, the most incarnational liturgies of the entire Christian year, we would normally expect to come forward and not just give a polite Episcopalian handshake at the greetings of the peace, much less an elbow bump, but to actually touch and hold and gently bathe and wipe dry the feet of another person, sometimes someone we may know, sometimes a complete stranger. But this year, due to COVID restrictions, we're remembering this humble act of Jesus, not by reenacting it, but virtually by hearing the story once again, and perhaps by remembering moments of foot washing in years past, or imagining future years in which we can take up this ancient practice of kindness, of intimate cleansing touch once more. Some years ago, my spouse Michael and I happened to be on the big island of Hawaii during Holy Week, and I vividly remember attending a Maundy Thursday service in a very small wood-beamed Episcopal church. I remember falling in line in the center aisle, barefoot, and walking up to the altar and washing the feet of someone I had never met and probably never would meet again, and then being seated to be washed by another. And in that small but faith-saturated church, I felt the sheer simplicity and the sheer loving kindness of this liturgy in a way I never had before. Maybe some of you have similar memories of a Maundy Thursday foot washing that especially touched you when the physicality and care enacted in this ritual reenacted the humility of Jesus and the vulnerability of Peter in the most personal way possible. And then there is the Last Supper, which we also remember tonight. And again, we can't share together in person, in community, but we remember in the retelling of the story of Jesus' own Last Supper, and in a certain hope and expectation that soon we can participate in this meal together again in the flesh. In another particular way tonight, we remember Jesus' Last Supper as the Jewish Passover meal, the Seder, which our Jewish siblings observed last Saturday evening and continue to observe throughout this week. Jesus and his disciples as faithful Jews also came together in faithfulness to the ancient commandment we heard in tonight's reading from Exodus. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. So our remembrance of Jesus and the gospel message of love and service is layered upon an even more ancient remembrance of God's liberation of the Israelites from slavery into freedom. This layering is key to tonight's observances. Through his actions of kneeling, washing, and sharing a meal with his disciples, Jesus was saying, this is what liberation means. If you want to be free, you must serve, you must love. 
This is the paradoxical command at the heart of the gospel that our greatest freedom, even our greatest victory in life, will be found not in striving for success or wealth or even for perfection, but in tenderness and humility. Humility. This is why we engage in Lenten practices of self-denial and contemplation. One of the Lenten practices that always somehow finds me is to reread some books that are old friends. And one that I come back to every Lenten season is a lovely gentle book by my friend Philip Bennett, an Episcopal priest in Philadelphia, who is both a psychoanalyst and a spiritual director. The book is entitled, Let Yourself Be Loved. It's all about practicing the presence of God, the awareness that God loves and delights in us and wants to be with us just as we would want to be with someone we're in love with. Regarding humility specifically, Philip writes, our English word humility is linked to the root word humus, meaning earth, ground. It means being planted in the ground of our being, knowing ourselves to be rooted in our creaturehood, needing first to receive love before we can give it. That is perhaps why Jesus in his wisdom knew that he had to wash Peter's feet. And if Peter refused to receive this love, he would never truly have a part in the life of the risen Christ. Philip continues, Unfortunately, certain misguided religious teachings have given us a shame-based idea of humility. Humility becomes linked with a sense of shame, while a healthy love of self is confused with self-absorption and self-centeredness. Yet the opposite is the case. The more we are able to love and respect ourselves as a gift from God, the more we are able to love others. And so tonight we are invited, yes, commanded, to practice humility. To practice humility in its original meaning, to remember that we are grounded in the earth. As we heard at the very beginning of Lent, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. But also we are grounded in the soil of God's pleasure and love for us. It is precisely in and through that awareness that we are invited to reach out in love and service toward others. We can't physically wash one another's feet tonight, but in a few moments, we will observe a related ritual that also expresses our commitment to service, to care, and yes, even care for the feet of others. During the season of Lent, members of our worshiping community contributed over $7,500 through $40 donations for the 40 days of Lent to purchase socks and sneakers to be distributed through our cathedral community cares. So we may not wash one another's feet tonight, but we will clothe and care for the often weary and worn feet of others whose need is greatest among us. And we ourselves, however good and giving we want to be, we also have needs, especially in this seemingly never ending time of the twin pandemics of COVID and of anti-Black and anti-Asian racial violence. We are sick and tired of living in fear and the ever-present specter of racism. We are sick and tired of confinement, isolation, restrictions, and masks. Even as more vaccines, thankfully, become available in this city, we are so eager for that light at the end of the tunnel that many of us are itching to cut loose too soon, and our city is already seeing a spike in cases again. We cry, how long, O Lord, and we long for safety, for touch, for justice, for communion. Jesus told his disciples, just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. I think sometimes as Christians, we focus so hard on the second half of this sentence that you should love one another, that we almost miss the first half, just as I have loved you. How in the world could Jesus be talking about serving, washing one another, and loving one another at a time like this when his betrayer was on the way out the door to cause his death? And yet, there Jesus was, loving his disciples, loving Peter, even loving Judas himself. There's almost a benediction in the way he sends him out. If we knew what Jesus knew in that hour, wouldn't we be more likely either to try to do something to thwart Judas or else to flee and hide, save our skins in the hope of carrying out our work another day? 
But Jesus rested fully securely in God's love, was one with God's love, was and is God's love. Jesus knew that hate and the power of death were and still are all around. Hate and the power of death cannot be evaded and brute force will not finally overcome them. But hate and death won't win ultimately, no matter what happens, if we remain grounded, humble, planted firmly in the soil of God's love and the power of the knowledge that we are loved, known by God intimately, sought out and upheld by God's undying love for us. Just as I have loved you, this comes first, just as Jesus first washed the feet of his disciples. All our strength and all our own loving flows first from this source, this assurance that we, you and me and everyone in this city and in this world are all God's beloved. Peter protests at first when Jesus comes to him with that towel and basin. What was Peter's resistance? You will never wash my feet. Was it a feeling of unworthiness? Perhaps even a fear of letting himself be loved so intimately by Jesus? Or was it Peter the muscular fisherman resisting being that much out of control and letting another do for him what he could do, perhaps felt he should have already done for himself. We can all imagine out of our own resistances a myriad of reasons why Peter might have put up that protest. How often do we let our own inner fears or some secret sense of shame, some dust on us that we fear can never be washed away, or even our own need for control, get in the way of opening ourselves up freely to the love of God and other people. How often do we let messages, whether from our childhood or from our society or from lethal forms of prejudice, tell us we don't measure up and never will, or that we have to perform, have to earn approval, or have to be the masters of our own destinies? Jesus answered Peter, and Jesus answers all our fears and our resistances. Unless I wash you, you have no share in me. No matter how much we profess our faith, no matter what we do, no matter how compulsively we do it, we won't understand what Jesus is truly offering Peter and all of us unless we allow God to serve us, unless we open ourselves up, maybe just the tiniest crack in our defenses to allow the possibility that God really does delight in us and longs to be with us and simply to love us, not for anything we have done, but because we exist, and our existence is a delight to God. It is in this opening to God's love and delight that we will find the true source of our capacity to love and to delight in and serve one another as God's own hands in the world. When we begin to experience this love, even in this time of COVID restrictions, and in the midst of heightened anxieties of all kinds, when we experience this love through prayer, through music, through nature, even through simply practicing our daily routines and tasks with an intent of mindfulness toward God, we begin to discover that we are in a dance of mutual love with God. Just six days before this Last Supper, according to John, Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anointed Jesus' feet with perfume, foreshadowing the anointing of his body in death, and wiped them with her hair. In the story of that earlier supper, six days before, it is Judas himself who protests the extravagance of her gift and her loving service. Mary enacted God's love in anointing Jesus in that moment. The memory of that recent intimate washing of his feet with perfume as well as Judas's rebuke, must have echoed in Jesus's mind when he took up a towel and approached Peter's feet. Mary had in turn been empowered and emboldened by her recognition of God's amazing love through the raising of her brother Lazarus from the dead just a short time before. So the story we enter into tonight is cradled in an amazing way by two resurrections, Lazarus and Jesus and three washings or anointings. Mary's anointing of Jesus, Jesus's washing of Peter, and then the women's washing of Jesus and anointing again at his tomb. 
The mystery and the perfume of washing, healing, and new life is all around us tonight, both past and future. So come, enter into the mystery of this crucial turning point in the history. As Jesus looks backward in reverent remembrance of the Passover liberation of God's people and God's love expressed through the raising of his beloved friend, expressed through perfume, washing, and meal. And now as Judas leaves and walks out into the night, Jesus looks ahead to the unfolding of the nightmarish events yet to come. But in reverse order, leaving the meal, he dies in agony, but then is washed and anointed by the beloved community of women and finally is raised again to a new life into which he brings us all. It's a circle dance of serving and being served, loving and being loved. It's fitting then that as we grow in God's love for us, we also grow in our capacity to love and serve until that time when we all share the banquet, all social distance removed once and for all to feast at the heavenly table. By these commandments, Jesus' commandments, to serve, to remember, and to love. We are not bound, but freed. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm Clifton Daniel, Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine here in New York City. And we're standing in a place many of you have never been before, but it is one of the most holy places in the whole cathedral. 
This is the home of the Cathedral Community Cares, CCC. The great canons of St. John Divine gathered together to help us out with some issues that we had. Um, the issue is with getting uh, donation, donated clothing, sneakers, shoes, socks, and other items. We have people come from Brooklyn, the Bronx, yes. Staten Island on Sunday mornings just to get something because there was at one point in the beginning of COVID, we literally were the only people open. The clothing closet alone, I believe we were averaging every Sunday 145 people as Robert was serving over 700 people. I was always taught by my grandmother that you should eat something that anybody that you would eat that they should eat so we all are equal so we all got to eat the same thing so I was always taught that. When the pandemic f first started uh, we began to hear that there were people coming here in search of food who were not the people that you'd think would be coming here in search of food yes. and we began to hear that there were people who could afford either a place to live or something to eat and so I think what I've discovered more than anything else in coming here is that the kind of person you expect to see at a, in a soup kitchen is not necessarily the kind of person who comes here now. And there's a lot of need that's hidden in New York. In the beginning of COVID, we opened it every week to everybody. And the impact was really felt because they cleaned us out. Mm -hmm. And that's why every week we were asking the media team to put, we need, we need, we need. And to this community's credit, they gave, they gave, they gave. Mm -hmm. When people come here, they don't necessarily want to be here. And that's a misconception. You know, it's Manhattan. If it's free, it's for me. No. They don't really want to be here. They have no choice to be here. Nothing, sorry, nothing is more impactful to see somebody come through that door, one barefoot and a plastic bag around another. It's so impactful to see a mother with three children standing online for Robert's food. Not only the hot food that he makes, but he also makes two types of cold sandwiches. So they're down there prepping like crazy in, on Sunday. Terry, it's the 21st century. Everybody deserves a roof over their head, something hot in their stomach, and a place to go when they're sick. And CCC, we're giving you two out of three. Mm. So we're very proud of that. So I, I actually started to come to CCC to help out, not to show up as a clergy person, but to help out with making food because a friend of mine, who really is not a churchy person at all, a baptized person, but not a churchy person at all, he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think what that taught me is that, you know, Jesus continues his ministry in all kinds of people. And some of those people are church people like us, and I don't mean like people like collar people, but people who go to church. But Jesus uses all kinds of people so his work in the world can continue. And I think, that, um, I think that's also a very humbling thing to realize, that we in the church don't have the monopoly on Jesus' ministry in the world at all. Yeah. I like to say that we practice what everybody else preaches. We put the word out that we're looking for slightly used clothing. Our definition of slightly used could be different from other people. <laughs> and to be honest, you get the best and sometimes you get the worst. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity to give someone something that's brand new mm -hmm. is a game changer. So the two biggest things that are asked for are always socks, always sneakers, and always undergarments. Those are the three top things. We also wanted to thank the Bombas group. Uh, Bombas has been supporting us with uh, donated socks for like the last, I want to say a year. We received about over 5,000 pair of free socks. Uh, this year we're, we're close to 10,000 we're going to receive and they're starting uh, underwear. So we're going to see how that plays out. Uh, but today we definitely wanted to thank the Cannons for coming by because they knew that we had a need and they helped us with it. Uh, they raised about 
7,500, 7,500, which is actually pretty good. <laughs> it's very good. It's very impressive. This is going to put a lot of smiles on a lot of faces as we start to go through the season, without a doubt. I just want to thank uh, Thomas, Vanessa, and Robert uh, for this beautiful witness. There's um, a question people in church circles often ask. If your church wasn't here, would anyone miss it? And I think in the case of the congregation, um, it's actually kind of an open question. I mean, the cathedral's been here for 125 years, the congregation about 29. And so the cathedral has been able to do liturgy services without a congregation for the first 100 years of its existence. So I don't think the cathedral's Sunday services would miss a congregation. And certainly people in the congregation would miss each other and the lunches that we serve to one another. But would the community really miss us? I don't think so. Compared to would the community miss CCC? Absolutely. And so I just want to thank all of you for showing the congregation how to be church. Because church ultimately exists not for the members there, but for the members or the people who are not yet part of that community. That's what church is for. It's for the members to serve the people who are not yet part of that community. And I just, it's just profoundly moving that you are doing this work and that we in the congregation are now starting to slowly do that work with you. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you, Thank you. and to Thank teach you. us how to be church. Let us pray for the church and for the world, for the entire human family for which Jesus in his love was willingly betrayed and given to death on a cross, but especially for those who have died with him in the waters of baptism. For the church, in silence we pray. For Andrew, chosen by God as our bishop, and for Alan and Mary, who assist him in his ministry, and for all who serve us who have been called to serve the world in Jesus' name, in silence we pray. For God's chosen people in these Passover days, Jesus' own beloved siblings, and for the conversion and healing of those who hate them today, even as they hated him, in silence we pray. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for our own nation, for the people and the government of Myanmar, for the public health officials of the European Union, for order and peace, for justice and mercy, for health and prosperity, in silence we pray. For the sick and the suffering, especially those living under the burden of COVID, for the unemployed and the underemployed, especially those undone by the pandemic, for prisoners and captives, refugees and exiles, the homeless and the homebound, for everyone in need or trouble or distress or despair, in silence we pray. For the dead, especially those who died since we last celebrated the Paschal days. And for others we miss and mourn. We see them, 
and we name them, and in silence we pray. God, our Father, whose Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in a wonderful sacrament, has left us a memorial of his passion. Grant us so to venerate the sacred mysteries of his body and blood, that we may ever perceive within ourselves the fruit of his redemption, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.